That Jussie Smollett story is something that we were talking about on day one, and we will continue to talk about it as it's been a remarkable turn of events today in that story. Uh, Joining us to discuss is a journalist and photographer, editor over at Quillette, and a man I've had my eye on for a while since his great reporting of the Antifa riots and conflicts with police in Portland, Andy No. Uh, Andy, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you, Mr. O'Connor. Are you based out of Portland? I'm just curious, because you did such great reporting there uh, in the uh, latter days of the last year. I am in Portland. I am at the epicenter of Antifa activism. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to have you back to talk about that, because what you saw in the way the police conducted themselves, uh, apparently on orders uh, from the mayor, is a, a remarkable untro- untold story. But you were telling it, so I just want to take a moment to thank you for that. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I I was really, really impressed with your article published at National Review this week in wake of the uh, Jesse Smollett story uh, with regard to uh, what this means for our nation in terms of how eager people seem to be to embrace these uh, hate crime hoaxes. Why don't you sort of lay out the thesis for us? Well, I was motivated to write the story because I was frustrated that it seemed like nobody had learned the lesson from the Covington school boys uh, hoax that was fabricated by Mr. Nathan Phillips. And so what I was trying to communicate in this column for National Review is that uh, just like with the Covington story, this uh, suspected hoax story will quickly blow over in the media and people will move on to the next thing. But I think we need to put, we need to be having a conversation about America's sickness. I think our country and our culture is ill because as a society, it's become mainstream in our culture and politics to worship victimhood and grievance. And not so long ago, I was in um, in the university, so this was the world I was surrounded in. And now I see that it has seeped out into the rest of society. You see how the Democratic politicians very cynically exploited this story for mm. political gain, some of them even using it to press for hate crime legislation. Um, I hope that with now the... Chicago police confirming in a press conference conference in this morning all the things that Smollett um, is accused of doing. I hope it lays clear that we this we should not just move on as this is another story. This is emblematic of a pattern of of. Uh, of an illness in yeah. this country. I, I do appreciate that you call it an illness, uh, specifically that there's this uh, celebration of victimhood. And, and to me, the most compelling part of uh, today's remarkable press conference in Chicago was when the uh, police superintendent laid out the motive here, that he was unhappy with his salary and he thought that this would further his career. That really says something about our culture and the entertainment industry that, that, that oh, did we lose him? Uh, But let me continue my thought here. It really does say something about our culture and our society and certainly the entertainment industry that Jesse Smollett uh, dwells within, where it was absolutely conceivable and logical and reasonable for him to think that his career would advance, that this would help him in the long run, even so much that he would be able to increase his salary on his show by being the victim of a homophobic racist hate crime. That that's a serious problem that Andy knows so brilliantly lays out in this National Review article. And the headline is hate crime hoaxes reflect America's sickness. Uh, That's that really is the problem that not only do we as a nation, of course, would immediately have sympathy for a victim of a crime like this. That's one thing to have sympathy. But it's reached this point of of bizarre celebrity that this actor actually thought he could increase his career, increase his salary, and help himself by being the victim of this crime. We have Andy No back. I hope you caught the very end of that. That's that's a remarkable statement that he thought this would help his career and he'd get rich off of this. Yes, yeah, so it's been reported that he makes uh, in excess of 60000 U.S. dollars per episode. And if we need any more evidence of Mr. Uh, Smollett being a narcissist, I think that the Chicago police made that very clear. He was willing to blame an entire group of people to advance his entertainment career. 
So, and I mean, again, this goes back to your article about America's sickness. It's not just our culture and society having uh, instinctive and reflexive sympathy for someone as we would uh, that would have a uh, suffer from a crime like this, but there's actually a reward. There's there's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow because we have glorified this kind of thing, and and it's a lie. Uh, and that's the other part of this. Uh, you you use the plural hate crime hoaxes reflect America's sickness because this is not a one off. There have been a lot of these recently. There's been a lot. You know, I I after the story was falling apart, I was just very curious about how many hoaxes have been blamed on Donald Trump or his voters. And so I just looked from the past two years and I was shocked. There were dozens and dozens of confirmed hoaxes in this country. There was quite a large sample size for a relative, for a short time period. Uh, most of them were centered. Uh, there was a spike of hate hoaxes right after the election. And then many of them have been happening periodically at universities, which again, loops back to my, my view that the, the campuses really breed this uh, grievance and victim um, culture. Yeah. Uh, much of your reporting uh, is is reflected in your Twitter feed, as is the case these days with uh, with journalists. And I appreciate that. It's a good way to get a, a look at what you're focusing on. And you seem to um, uh, highlight quite a bit from what's known as the gay activist media, um, Out Magazine and other uh, media figures who uh, really sort of took up the homophobic uh, aspect of this hate crime and how they uh, they seem to really, I don't want to say relish, but it's seemed like they did relish this. They really took advantage very quickly. Can you shed a little light on on the on the gay community's perspective on this, the activist gay community, I should say, versus the the uh, the racial element? Sure. As this society has become more and more tolerant, and we have survey data to show that this country is becoming less racist, less anti-gay, this puts a lot of the establishment gay media as well as the gay lobby sort of at risk of losing relevancy. So they do drum up a lot of these stories. And I think um, it's my feeling that there's this sort of glee that they that comes with these stories, that they, they want it to be true because it brings in more clicks. And uh, with some of the organizations, it can bring in more money with fundraising. And now we're now that the story is pretty much um, confirmed to be a hoax. We're we're going to see the spin from these organizations, which is that uh, what he did was wrong, but uh, it started a good conversation, national discussion mm. on homophobia, on racism, and the intersection of these two. I mean, this is just a way, basically, to incentivize future hoaxes, because in the minds of for the people who create, who fabricate and orchestrate these attacks on themselves or, or others, they do it because they actually really think that they're doing something good. And unless we expect everybody to come out unequivocally and, and say that this is not okay and that there's no silver lining in any of this. I mean, you just look at the resources that were taken from the Chicago police to investigate. Twelve detectives were used. Uh, to investigate this, when Chicago has a very a, a low percentage of their homicides are, are solved, so that's like the darker side of the story that I hmm. I, I don't I'm annoyed by the thing. Yeah. Uh, our guest is Andy No. He is an independent journalist and photographer. He edits at uh, Quillette, and the article that we're discussing is his column at National Review. Uh, I, I'd also like to talk about it. You're right. One of the biggest problems with this and one of the reasons why the police take this so seriously is that it is a, a drain on resources. It doesn't make the city look good. It's a distraction as they go after a false report versus actually using their police manpower on the very real crime problem in Chicago. But there's another element to this. Uh, and, and if I may just, you know, for the purposes of this conversation it's relevant that you are of asian descent you are you would be you know on the face of it considered a minority in this country and 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 i would think for a youngster growing up in this country if they are black if they are asian they're latino they're of arabic descent or if they're gay 
Uh, they are hearing this relentless message from our pop culture and from our media and from politicians that this is a hateful nation, that because of the last election, uh, there is a target on the back of all of those young children who are minorities or gay, and that they should fear a violent attack. That has got to be a debilitating way to go through life. And I, I really do. I am concerned about children living in this climate. We need to fix that, don't we? Absolutely. I would also like to point out that I'm also a, a gay journalist. And so my I feel a bit personally invested in the story and debunking some of these hate hoaxes because I really resent that activists are trying to actively actively foster fragility in minorities, fragility and resentment as well. That's a great way of putting it, and I didn't I didn't realize that uh, you, that you were gay as well. So I think that does add an extra element, I think, for you here. Um, so I, I mean, I try to be a solution based program as as much as possible these days. What is the way forward here? Uh, what what are what are we to do uh, to actually sort of rein this in now and pull back? I know everyone says, well, the media needs to start acting more responsibly, but after Covington, they didn't. After the Kavanaugh hearings, they didn't. Now after this, they're not. I mean, the, the media is not going to change their behavior unless they actually start feeling some repercussions. The issue with broadcast media, who has a lot of influence, is that they pay all these commentators to come in to give their hot takes, and these commentators are frequently inflammatory and sensational, so it skews the public perception of what's really happening in this country. We need to center caution and skepticism and facts and data. The FBI does record the data on bias-motivated uh, crimes in this country, and when you analyze it, the per capita hate crimes that happen for our population are really low, but yet we have this paradox of people making a catastrophe out of uh, every single anecdote and using it to push what I view as propaganda Hmm. um, against this country, against our society, our culture, and there are a lot of people who will gain politically from it or gain power from it, so there's also a power grab angle to this as well. Um, our solution, I guess, is just to, I mean, I think the Chicago police, what they did shows that um, there are consequences for fabricating hoax, yes. hate hoax crimes. And police departments that don't investigate fully or uh, somehow feel sympathetic for the fake victim, they need to move past that. Hoax, hate hoaxes, if they are revealed to be hoaxes, need to be exposed. And it needs to a precedent needs to be set that this is not something that our country will stand for. It, it it seems to me, though, Andy, you know that one of the obvious results of the Smollett affair will not be that the hoaxes will uh, will die down, but they'll just go to the media and report the hoax and bypass the police. Uh, perhaps one way for the media to self police is that they will only report on something if there is, in fact, a, a valid police report. Otherwise, you know, why allow yourself, uh, if you're a news station, to be manipulated by someone? If, if they're a victim, then they should file a police report and then it's news. Absolutely. What I noticed when I was looking into all these hate hoaxes is that the one thing that they frequently almost always do is that they go to the media first and or they make a social media post without going to the police because going to police and filing a false report then holds you accountable for a potential crime, right? Right. So news agencies need to take that into account with their reporting and center that at the, at the lead potentially if that is a part of the story that they're investigating. Uh, yeah, I, that would be a wonderful thing to see. I think that would be a good start on this. Uh, Andy, no, really good stuff. And and I uh, am very serious about this. Now that you have our contact information and we know each other and you know Tasia, our great producer, keep us informed on what's going on in Portland. It is, sort of, as you said, the epicenter of, uh, of Antifa violence and a remarkable, remarkable story going on there about the mayor and the police department that I do want to shed more light on. So thank you for joining us and keep up the great work. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. That is Andy No, and you can follow him on Twitter. It's Mr. Andy No. No is spelled N G O. He is of Vietnamese descent, and uh, and uh, that's how you spell his last name. And it's got really, really good stuff. And I'm a, a big fan, as you can tell.